So we've covered the fight against liberalism, the fight against false optimism. Now today we turn to the fight against tyranny. <clears throat> um, we just covered the end of the special commission of 1925, which was a pivotal moment in my reading of Presbyterian history in the 1920s where the church basically decided that liberalism wasn't the problem, but that conservatives objecting to liberalism was the problem. <clears throat> um, so, <clears throat> sorry, that brings us to, um, in the midst of those reports coming out, one report came out in 1926, one part of that commission's report, one part came out in 1927, the final one. Um, in 1926 is also a year of significance for Machen because at the same assembly when the, the commissioners were hearing this report, Machen was being nominated uh, for a promotion to the chair of apologetics at Princeton Seminary. Um, <clears throat> There's some people might wonder why apologetics, since he was trained in New Testament. The lines of academic specialization weren't so nearly neatly drawn then as they are today, but also he had done a lot of work in defending Christianity from uh, unbelief. Uh, he defended the Bible from uh, liberal criticism. We'll talk about that more in another lecture. <clears throat> so in, in some ways it made a lot of sense. Um, but what, what made um, this appointment or nomination controversial was not simply that Machen was an identified conservative and maybe considered to be something of a pain in the neck, but at the spring meeting of the Presbytery of New Brunswick, um, he had voted no against a motion to affirm prohibition. Uh, this was the era of prohibition the mainline churches had fully supported prohibition because again, they were part of the progressive world and pro prohibition was part of progressivism. It was and the 18th amendment was, was one of the reforms that progressives were responsible for. As much as we might associate abstaining from alcohol as a fundamentalist conviction of some kind, mainline Protestants, modernists were also there as well. So Machen um, voted against this motion, and we'll get into the reasons why he did it, but this brings up the issue of his politics. Um, and his voting against this was used as evidence against his nomination because the chair of apologetics at Princeton and, and at Westminster, I don't know if it's still the case, I think it is in California, that the person who teaches apologetics also teaches ethics. And people at the assembly argued, well, how could somebody teach ethics if they're so confused or worse wrong about something as obvious as prohibition? Um, so what, is, what were Machen's politics like? Well, he was <clears throat> a libertarian. He was a Democrat. And the Democratic Party was a big tent. The Democratic Party was what represented the South, and other constituencies in the North, so it, it may sound odd to us for someone of Machen's stripe to be a Democrat, but it was fairly common then for someone coming from Maryland, <clears throat> um, and even, even other Southern Presbyterians would have sympathized more with the Democrats than perhaps the party of Lincoln. Um, <clears throat> so one of the areas in which uh, Machen was, he wrote lots of editor, letters to editors about various political matters. One of the letters he wrote about, uh, one of the topics he wrote a letter about was fingerprinting. Um, he, he was opposed to people getting fingerprinted as part of the criminal justice system. Um, he, he wrote, I am not objecting to, to voluntary fingerprinting for purposes of identification. That is available to everyone at the present time. What I am objecting to is compulsory fingerprinting by government officials. People seem to assume that there is no harm for enforcing people to do things which are thought to be for their own benefit. That is just where the difference of opinion comes in. To force people to do things under the plea that it is for their own benefit is paternalism. 
and paternalism ought to be hated with a perfect hatred by every real American. I wonder what he would have written about the vax mandate. Hmm. So there's one example. That's a flavor of his libertarianism. Another uh, issue about which he wrote was <clears throat> uh, prayer and Bible reading in public schools. He wrote at length about this. He was much in favor of Christian schools. He also was not a fan of public schools, but he knew that if with public schools in existence, you had to r r wrestle with some question about the introduction of prayer and Bible reading in them. And he was opposed to prayer and Bible reading in public schools. And one of the reasons for this was the following. The reading of selected passages from the Bible in which Jews and Catholics and Protestants and others can presumably agree should not be encouraged and still less should be required by law. The real center of the Bible is redemption, and to create the impression that other things in the Bible contain any hope for humanity apart from that is to contradict the Bible at its root. So again, another example, people using the Bible for civic purposes, that's a long tradition of that going back to the 1830s in Massachusetts and beyond, and people who were concerned about the Bible were concerned about their own communion. Roman Catholics objected to Bible reading in public schools because Protestants weren't reading the right Bible. They were reading a different version than Roman Catholics had. Also, Protestants read it without comment, and, and Roman Catholics didn't believe that should be done. But old school Presbyterians had objected to prayer and Bible reading in public schools on grounds like this because it was basically using the Bible for moral purposes and not for redemptive purposes, it's, it's proper. Um, <clears throat> and another very striking example of Machen's politics in relation to religious conviction is the matter of Sabbath legislation or blue laws. Uh, in 1933, Pennsylvania was considering revoking blue laws. This was, these were laws that closed businesses on Sunday. Um, and you might expect here Machen to say, well, wait a minute, aren't you using something like this for purposes that are in sort of infringements or convey a false impression to other people who don't hold to Christianity or hold to the, this interpretation of the Fourth Commandment? Um, the reason for this um, legislation, in fact, or this revoking of legislation was the rise of the National Football League. <clears throat> the National Football League, professional football, needed to find a day to, on which to play. College football owned Saturday. They still do. So if the NFL, a new league, <clears throat> was going to make it, it needed to have a day to play and not compete against college football. <clears throat> so Sunday was the day legislators then wanted to think about. Could we make Sunday? Could we allow people to, to work on that day, open up businesses for certain purposes? So Machen wrote a letter to the governor of Pennsylvania. Along these lines, it is clear that in this matter of Sunday legislation, the liberty of part of the people will have to be curtailed. It is impossible that people who desire a Sunday, a quiet Sunday, should have a quiet Sunday while at the same time, people who desire commercialized sport on Sunday should have commercialized sport. The permission of commercialized sport will necessarily change the character of the day for all people and not merely for part of the people. The only question, therefore, is whose liberty is to be curtailed. I am convinced that in this case, it ought for the welfare of the whole people to be the liberty of those who desire commercialized sport. <clears throat> the curtailment of their liberty through the existing law does not, I am convinced, go beyond reasonable bounds. There is, it seems to me, a sharp distinction of principle between complete prohibition of some form of activity or enjoyment and reasonable regulation of it in the interest of other people. To ask that commercialized sport should dispense with one day out of seven for the benefit of that large part of our population that desires acquired Sunday and believes that it is necessary to the welfare of the state does not seem to me to be unreasonable. Of course, it is perfectly clear that in a democracy, the majority should rule in this matter as in other matters. 
I should be <clears throat> the last to advocate any attempt to make people religious or even to make people ordinarily moral or decent against their will by mere civil and legislative enactment. I should also be the last to advocate any tyrannical imposition of the convictions of a minority upon the majority. But how shall the majority will be exercised? I think that it ought to be exercised through the ordinary processes of representative government. To allow commercialized sport on Sunday in Pennsylvania will be a radical change in the whole life of our people. It is a wise provision of representative government that such radical changes should not be hastily accomplished, as might be the case by the referendum vote, but that they should be accomplished only when it is clear that the majority of the people really and seriously and permanently desires the change. <clears throat> and then he goes on, of course, my own cu cultivation of a quiet Sunday is based on considerations much more fundamental than these. I am a Christian, and it is quite clear that a commercialized Sunday is inimical to the Christian religion. There are many other Christians in Pennsylvania, and because they are Christians, they do not cease to be citizens. They have a right to be considered by their fellow citizens and by the civil authorities. But the reason why they can, with a good conscience, be enthusiastic advocates of the Christian practice in the matter of Sunday is that they regard it as a right, as, excuse me, as right, and as for the highest well-being of the entire state. So Machen is trying to think about even laws like Sabbath laws in lines of representative government, democracy, legislative processes, majority, minority, rights of majority, rights of the minority. <clears throat> He's not coming down with the idea that God's law requires this, so therefore the state should not do it. Um, he may, in some ways, by constantly bringing up for the good of the state, be guilty of a kind of paternalism himself in thinking that observing these kinds of laws is for the good of the state. I'm sure he could have elaborated why that was the case more. He doesn't in this, in this particular letter. Um, I think a lot of people would agree that one day out of seven is a decent way of, um, <clears throat> is, is good for society in many respects. Vacations are considered a valuable thing. Rest is considered a valuable thing. So one day in seven is, is useful. I would like to see what Machen would do with Jewish Americans who want to observe Saturdays, but everything is open for them on that day. Um, so there is some tussle here about how to observe holy days. Um, and that goes on in American uh, society to this day. One last example, the one that did get him in trouble, was prohibition. Um, and here, Machen's reasons for voting against the motion in Presbytery are, again, revealing of both his libertarianism as well as his uh, understanding of the church and its responsibilities. Um, I should also add that Machen wrote this statement to explain his, um, his, his vote because there was so much opposition to him at, at the General Assembly. And yet it was never published, this statement, until we were able to include it in the selected shorter writings. It was never published because his friends and, and advisors said, if you publish this, this is going to do more harm than good. You're going to inflame more people against you. So it was never published. But anyway, this is part of what he thought in trying to explain <clears throat> his vote. In the first place, no one has a greater horror of the evils of drunkenness than I, or a greater detestation of any corrupt, corrupt traffic which has sought to make profit of this terrible sin. It is clearly the duty of the church to combat this evil, meaning drunkenness and corrupt traffic. With regard to the exact form, however, in which the power of civil government is to be used in this battle, there may be differences, difference of opinion. <clears throat> Zeal for temperance, for example, <clears throat> pardon me, would hardly justify an order that all drunkards should be summarily butchered. The end in that case would not justify the means. Some men hold that the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act are not a wise method of dealing with the problem of intemperance, and that indeed those measures in the effort to accomplish moral good are really causing moral harm. 
I am not expressing any opinion on this question now and did not do so by my vote in the Presbytery of New Brunswick. But I do maintain that those who hold the view that I have just mentioned have a perfect right to their opinion, and so far as the law of our church is concerned, should not be coerced in any way by ecclesiastical authority. The church has a right to exercise discipline where authority for condemnation of an act can be found in Scripture. But it has no such right in other cases. And skirt, certainly Scripture authority cannot be found in the particular matter of the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act. So that's the political matter and whether the church has any purchase in that debate about the Volstead Act and how to correct for drunkenness or cor corrupt traffic in selling alcohol. Uh, the 18th Amendment and Volstead Act may not be the best ways of doing it. In fact, some would argue that the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act actually created the corrupt traffic of, um, of alcohol consumption during the 1920s and facilitated the rise or the spread of organized crime. Um, but he goes on to talk specifically then about what the church is called to do. <clears throat> the church, I hold, ought to refrain from entering in its corporate capacity into the political field. Chapter 31, Article 4 of the Confession of Faith reads, Synods and councils are to handle or conclude nothing but that which is ecclesiastical and are not to intermeddle with the civil affairs which concern the commonwealth unless by way of humble petition in cases extraordinary or by way of advice for satisfaction of conscience if they be, if they be thereunto required by the civil magistrate. End of quotation of the confession. <clears throat> Machen goes on. In making of itself, in so many instances, primarily an agency of law enforcement, and thus enga engaging in the duties of the police, the church, I am constrained to think, is in danger of losing sight of its proper function. Important indeed are the functions of the police and members of the church in their capacity as citizens should aid by every proper means within their power in securing the discharge of those functions. But the duty of the church in its corporate capacity is of a quite different nature. And that really is a way of saying Machen is a believer in the spirituality of the church. The church stays in its lane of addressing spiritual affairs. <clears throat> so in many respects, the spirituality of the church is in some ways the flip side of libertarianism. Um, and, and both of these ideas in Machen is libertarianism, his belief in the spirituality of the church, were part of his ammunition against progressivism and, and the general drift of American society and the churches in concert with it. <clears throat> so Machen was trying to stand up to progressivism in his time. Progressives were changing America. It's also important to say that progressives were responding to a changing American, America. I myself may not like the way progressives responded. Machen clearly didn't, but it was clear that American society had changed. When you look at the tremendous wealth that had been generated by industrialization, you look at the wealth gap between labor and industrialists, when you look at the all the new immigrants living in American cities, working in these industries, you do recognize that America is a different place from the original 13 states of 1789-90. So progressives were trying to respond to that. Again, whether they responded well or correctly is another matter, but there was a different America, and they were, were responding to that, but didn't mean that someone like Machen or other people who opposed progressivism had to like it. Machen was very much fighting progressivism. Fighting liberalism in the Presbyterian Church was one uh, sign of that fighting progressivism. But Machen opposed the formation of the Federal Department of Education, which was proposed in the 1920s. Machen testified before a Senate committee against the Federal Department of Education. Machen won then. He lost, though ultimately, in 1978, the Carter administration formed the Federal Department of Education. 
Um, he, he opposed prohibition, another landmark legislative, legislative initiative of progressives. He opposed child labor laws, not because he approved of ch children laboring in factories or in unsafe conditions or laboring more than they should. It was because he believed parents should be responsible for how their children work, how the ch children behave, how the children engage in the world. And if families needed some help from children working, that might be permissible. Overall, he opposed the central centralization of power, <clears throat> and he especially opposed that centralization of power in the church. And it's, it's really one of the striking things that in the case of liberals and the Presbytery of New, uh, New York, the ordination of ministers who would not affirm the virgin birth, um, the General Assembly, the commission were very reluctant to use the power of General Assembly against that kind of liberalism. But when it came to conservatives, it really did become much more obvious that the church was willing to use the power of the General Assembly, use the power of centralization against them. <clears throat> um, so that brings us back to what happened to Machen in 1926 and his nomination uh, to be the professor of apologetics and ethics at Princeton Seminary. Well, they tabled that motion for a year, and then in 1927, uh, the General Assembly, again, because Princeton Seminary is an agency of the General Assembly, and the Committee on Theological Education oversees the work of that particular seminary. Not all the seminaries in the PCUSA were under the oversight of the General Assembly. Some were under synods, some were under presbyteries even, some were independent like Union and like Westminster might be. Um, <clears throat> so th it was the case that Princeton being the first Presbyterian seminary came under the agency uh, oversight of the General Assembly. So th they tabled Machen's nomination, but that in 1927 then began an investigation of Princeton Seminary to see what was causing the controversy there. They'd already done one committee to figure out what was happening in the church. Now they're s establishing a committee to figure out why the faculty at Princeton is uh, in controversy or the faculty in opposition to the president. And um, <clears throat> here, the transcript of that investigation is simply fascinating. The, uh, there's one copy of it, at least at Westminster in Phil Philadelphia in the archives. Um, and you can hear uh, answers given to the committee, not only from Machen, but from Erdman, from, from Voss, from C.W. Hodge, from a number, variety of faculty members there who are giving their own understanding of what the controversy in the, in the seminary is. And generally speaking, the controversy is an old one of old school versus new school. People like Stevenson, the president, people like Erdman, a, an evangelical there, are new schoolish in orientation <clears throat> whereas m most of the faculty are old school in orientation. But that committee uh, gives a report and they argue that the seminary needs to be reorganized. And this is a really <clears throat> intriguing aspect of the Presbyterian controversy that the way, and I don't, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, um, but it is curious that the way that the Presbyterian Church was able to get around conservatives in the church was able, they were able to reorganize different institutions, but sometimes even presbyteries, so that conservatives would be in the minority of those institutions. That was a way to sort of dissolve conservative dissent in the church, and that's what happened in the case of Princeton. The recommendation from the committee was that really the problem at, West, at Princeton, excuse me, was administrative. They had a board of directors that oversaw the academic affairs. They had a board of trustees that oversaw financial affairs. They had a president. And the committee thought that this was an unworkable uh, 
administrative situation. It also happened to be that conservatives dominated the board of directors. <clears throat> conservatives did not dominate the board of trustees. So what the committee proposed was to merge those two boards together. And, there, and at that point, conservatives become the minority in the board of directors at, or the board of trustees at Princeton Seminary. The committee also recommended giving the president more power, um, which uh, is, I guess, neither here nor there, but that's also sort of curious, perhaps. But again, that would be a way of minimizing the conservative voice at Princeton. That report comes out in 1927, and it's held up for two years. It doesn't go into effect until 1929. Partly, it's held up because there is a question in the courts. Does the General Assembly have the power to change these boards at, at, the, um, at the seminary? There's, there are many, there are lawyers, and Machen even has his brother help out with this, his brother who's an attorney. There are lawyers who are looking at the original charter of the seminary with the state of New Jersey, <clears throat> which has to grant the, the degrees, whether the, the laws of New Jersey will allow this to happen, that's held up in some kind of um, uh, reports for, for a variety of years. The church is not confident that it can go through with this initially, but eventually they do prevail. The re report goes through in, in 1929. But again, one, of the, one other holdup was a petition that went around the whole denomination to support Princeton Seminary as it was then constructed or as it was then administered. And this petition received 10,000 signatures from ministers and elders in the church. And I did a recent calculation that at the time there were roughly 45,000 officers in the church. I think it was something like 13,000 ministers and the rest were elders. So they had <clears throat> 10 out of every 45, or one out of every f four or five, sign this petition. And to put that in some perspective, the signatures for the Auburn Affirmation only gained roughly 1,200 in total. Those two votes, or those two petitions, might suggest the PCUSA was much more conservative than it was liberal. Be that as it may, though, the, the report went forward. <clears throat> the seminary was reorganized, and that led to the founding of Westminster Seminary in really short time. The General Assembly met in late May and early June to, um, to ratify and affirm this report from the committee. And by September of 1929, Machen had to have a seminary ready to go. He had help with that. He wasn't the only one doing it, but still, that's a very short time to get a seminary up in operation in Center City, Philadelphia. <clears throat> and so I'll just conclude then here this lecture with um, a, a, an excerpt from Machen's opening address at, um, at Westminster Seminary. Westminster Seminary was originally at 1528 Pine Street in Center City, Philadelphia, about two blocks away from 10th Presbyterian Church, where, um, where Donald Gray Barnhouse was the pastor. Barnhouse and Machen were not always on the same page when it came to conservatism in the Presbyterian Church, even though they were both conservatives of a kind. Um, and the original convocation for Westminster, because they were meeting in two townhouses, they didn't have a an assembly hall in which to conduct this, this affair was at the Witherspoon building, which used to be the headquarters for the Board of Publications of the Presbyterian Church. It's a glorious building in downtown Philadelphia that has ornate edifice that is a testimony to Presbyterian history and Reformed history with busts and carvings of different figures in the history of the church. It really is a wonderful building. I've not ever been able to get inside because it has been since repurposed as an office building. <clears throat> so that is where this happened. And it's curious that Machen was still in good enough standing that he was able to rent facilities from the church for these, for these um, 
these exercises. So Machen has just talked about the task of Westminster Seminary. He's just described it, committed to systematic theology, committed to the Bible. And he, then he says, it is a task that needs especially to be undertaken at the present time. Fifty years ago, many colleges and universities and theological seminaries were devoted to the truth of God's word. But one by one, they have drifted away, often with all sorts of professions of orthodoxy, on the part of those who were responsible for the change. Until May 1929, <clears throat> one great theological seminary, the Seminary of Princeton, resisted bravely the current of the age. But now that seminary has been made to conform to the general drift. Signers of the Auburn Affirmation, a formal document which declares that acceptance of the virgin birth and, uh, and of four other basic doc articles of the Christian faith is not essential even for ministers actually sit upon the new governing board. And they do so apparently with the acquiescence of the rest. Not one word of protest against the outrage involved in their presences has been uttered, as far as, so far as I know, by the other members of the board. And a formal pronouncement signed by the president and the president of the board actually commends the 33 members of the board as men who have the confidence of the church. Surely it is quite clear in view of that pronouncement, as well as in the view of the personal personnel of the board, that under such a governing body, Princeton Seminary is lost to the evangelical cause. So that loss of Princeton leads to the founding of Westminster. And um, one could argue that Machen's own politics were responsible in part for the, the loss of Princeton. Did he, was he prudent in continuing the fight or was he just one squeaking wheel trying to resist overall and the squeaky wheel needed to be silenced? That's a question for, I guess, further future historians to decide. I know what my answer is, and you probably guess what it is, but it, there is a question there. So I will stop this lecture.